And now from the Corsair Hill Farm Studio, your host of rock stars of R&D, John Conway, owner and chief visioneer officer at 2015 Visioneers, where better vision brings better outcomes. Take it away, John. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks as always. Some really good playing there, Kurt, as always. Uh, sounded great. Uh, today we have uh, our distinguished guest, uh, uh, and uh, don't don't mispronounce it, John. I, I, yeah, I, I hesitated. <laughs> uh, Dr. Anton Nag, and Nudge. Convers- <laughs> I say it. You say it. Say it again. Nudge. No, hey, see, I wrong. screwed it up anyway. Oh my gosh! I, you could tell. I so this happens in life. You hesitate for a second because you're like, all of a sudden, you lose all confidence, right? And I did. I blew it. But that's, that's okay. I grew up with Tony with Nagy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, in the States, that's how it's pronounced. So it's kind of, it, I learned something today. Um, so Dr. Anton Naj. So uh, it's great to have you here. Um, and uh, we'll just go through a couple of sponsors and then uh, we'll get started. Cool. All right. So you heard Kurt, author, player, uh, great teacher. Uh, he can play ukulele. He's well known around the world for his ukulele playing, his guitar playing. He can play anything at, at any moment. So that's pretty uh, amazing. I can't play anything at any moment. So uh, <laughs> Black Sea Jewelers, uh, uh, I make the pen, they add the bling, and then we sell them to people that most likely have everything. But uh, they're really nice and uh, everybody likes their pens when they get them. Uh, solutions for health, alternative uh, health approaches. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's more like uh, precision nutrition, just like precision me- medicine, et cetera. So uh, talk to these guys if you if you want to try to get ahead of some things. And then Alexia uh, Alamo down in Florida, if you're looking for a, a, a house in Florida or you want to move to Florida or part-time, she'll really help you out. And we'll hit that, stop that. All right. So, Dr. Anton Naj. Uh, <laughs> Let's just keep it to Anton. It's easier. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Um, it's an interesting thing in life. Like, when everything's going well and you have that, I think it might be too, when you get older, you kind of start to have these senior moments where you kind of blank out sometimes. And it's like, so, but uh, there you I'm have it. I'm over 50 it's, now, so I can relate. I can relate. Yeah. I, yeah. I refer to them as brain farts, but that's probably yeah, not terribly, exactly. terribly good. <laughs> yes. So I think you know the drill. We re- this is all about you um, and really about your life and how it all started, where it started and your influences and how you, you know, evolved or the word in uh, biology is matured to this state of being today. And, um, you know, you're the founder and CEO of uh, uh, an automation company, which is pretty awesome and science and automation, because you can't forget about the science part of it. Um, And, uh, you know, you've had this journey. So I think, uh, you know, we briefly talked about a lot of people want to hear about these journeys, because some people, you know, um, my wife says the sun shines out of certain parts of your body. And uh, I don't get it. And, um, and others, it doesn't happen. And I, I, I don't really think that's the case. I think it's all based on persistence grit and hard work right and not giving up so and sometimes along the way you make a fool out of yourself or people oh, yeah. around you right <laughs> but so so but you know you live with i've had my moments like, yeah yeah we all have <laughs> so go ahead tell us where did it all start for you oh god well at birth i guess no um <laughs> you did oh, like, where were you born honestly yeah <laughs> I was born in uh, in Oak Lawn, Illinois, at Christ Hospital in Oak Lawn, Illinois, in 1970. Yeah. Um, no, I think really, you know, the the reason I, I ended up going into to, to science and R and D is it's a, it's a number of factors that came together. Mm. My father was a huge influence on me, so my he was a catalyst salesman who worked for um, Engelhart, first a company called Mallinckrodt. And then Engelhardt, based in Erie, Pennsylvania, which was ultimately taken over by BASF. Um, 
He's a World War II immigrant. He grew up as a kid in a, in a, in a tent refugee camp in Linz, Austria. He was born in Croatia. And after serving in the army, he was lucky he went in before Vietnam, so he couldn't be drafted afterwards. <laughs> um, when he got out of the service, he was working uh, at repairing, I think, various TVs and all the, a lot of places doing just repair work. And at some point, my mother said, you know what? You're too, too smart to be doing this. No, it was the Illinois Gas Technology Institute that he was working at. I forgot that was. And I have a signed picture of the blue flame my child remember the oh, blue really? flame it was the rock yeah, yeah. the rocket car from the 60s yeah, yeah my dad Absolutely. worked on that project yeah uh and it was my mother who kicked him in the butt and said nah you're too smart you need to go to college so my dad did two jobs during the day and, and went to night school at iit in chicago and his organic chemistry book used to go th flying through the room on occasion but uh <laughs> that's where i got my my first understanding of what chemistry is and what it means to study, because I'd go and visit him at, at IIT. He worked at yeah. a place called Nalco. I'd visit him at the plant there. Um, and when you're a kid, you know, that's really, you're very impressionable. Yeah. Um, and I was in a program that BP sponsored in Chicago as well, back in the 80s for kind of getting young people on board. And we used to be able to go in their big skyscraper downtown and see cool scientists talk about cool stuff. And I, um, I was not a terribly good high school student, but I had one teacher who believed in me, and that was Mr. Stankovitz. He was my physics teacher. <laughs> but that's all it and takes, he led, right? It's that one yeah, teacher. It was that one teacher, and he led the science club. And really, uh, at the end of the day, he really he totally inspired me with physics. So, And ultimately, when I went to college, it didn't because I loved languages. I loved music. Um, I loved science. Uh, ultimately, my parents said, you're going to study something you make money with. So pick something pragmatic. And I, well, my dad's a chemical engineer. I'll be a chemical engineer. And that's how the decision was made. So we both studied IIT. I went to the same school as my father. And um, yeah, I mean, between the two of us, I, uh, I partied a lot in college. <laughs> I played a lot of guitar in college. I was lucky that my parents would send me to Europe every summer. So I got to learn French really well. And I really, that's where I kind of fell in love with Europe. One of the reasons I live here now. Um, and after getting, I think like a 2.5 GPA coming out of IIT, I got very lucky. There was an exchange program sponsored by AT&T, the old telephone company, to go study in the Netherlands for a summer. And I got to work for the first time in a lab there. And that's kind of where I realized one of the reasons I wasn't so good in college is I'm not a book learner. I, I never liked reading books and just taking tests. And it was kind of like eating and regurgitating all the time. It was, right. I really, I'm a hands-on kind of guy. Um, turns out I'm a lot like my dad in that way as well. And yeah, this, is uh, a really, this is a really good point because... I think, um, you know, we talked, we briefly talked on this before, but people learn differently and, yeah. and, and maybe there's all types of reasons why and stuff like that, but having that hands-on learning experience sometimes triggers things in the brain as well. Like well, you talked about learning guitar, right? Mm. It has been the most difficult thing for me. Well, partly mm. is because I don't have the time to practice like I should be. But then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I'm not making the time. I, you know, there's all reasons there. But until you get the, the, the brain connection with the muscle connection, and everything, you're not, you'll never excel in the guitar unless you're some sort of savant in that area, no, right? No. But, but you see this in school where people may not have done as well book, you know, studying wise and stuff, but they have excelled using their hands and building things and, and then making those connections. What I find fascinating, you know, having a 12 year old kid today is he um, he's growing up in a world where Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, those are names everybody knows. You know, they're they're the they're the rock stars of the IT world. Yeah, uh, certainly more famous than I am and much, much more wealthy. But, um, you know, both of them are college dropouts. And um, I find it, it. It's great that IT people who, who have IT uh, talent, often self-taught can go out and start their own companies like that. Um, I find it a bit of a shame that in, in, in our part of the world, um, particularly my chemical engineering, it's really rare that you'll run across people who decide to, to go off the, the to, to, to take the path less traveled. 
Yeah. It's really, they go to college, they study, uh, and then they apply for jobs at, at the big companies and then go that way. Um, and I would, I would actually, I would wish there was, there was more people who took the leap and did something innovative on their own. So, uh, cause I think there's a lot, there's so, such a need for innovation in these areas. Um, yeah, but it's it's it gets it's gotten harder and harder. So when I first started out, I could get away with starting something in my garage, you know, from mm. a biopharma perspective. But it, it was starting to be like you know, regu- re- highly regulated. You know, I couldn't get certain mm. things delivered to my house. What? So there's there's all these now barriers for for preventing you from doing some of these things from a chemical engineering or, you know, a deeper science perspective, you can still do it, but I, I do, it's not easy. It's not easy to start some of these companies. Yeah. I mean, imagine being a college dropout and going uh, and convincing um, Chevron or Shell or BASF to invest in your company, especially here in Germany, in Germany, in Germany, they love this, these PhDs. <laughs> so it's really, if you, if you go to any of the big chemical companies here, they all have a doctor in front of their name, which, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, I love Germany. Don't get me wrong, but, um, a college degree or a PhD, um, does not by any means make you necessarily more smart. And, uh, you know, there's two small companies in the States that we do a lot of work with that I find really inspirational. One is called a company called Equilibar. They make back, back pressure controllers. I've become quite good friends with Jeff Jennings, the owner of it. It's a little outfit in Nashville, North Carolina, tucked away in the mountains, beautiful city. And um, Jeff used to work for DuPont. And DuPont built a, a X-ray photographic film factory in the forest because that's one of the cleanest, supposedly the cleanest air in North America. Unfortunately, it turns out pine trees produce a lot of acid. So it wasn't such a good idea after all. But to make a long story short, the digital age killed the, uh, the, that photography business. And um, Jeff and many of his colleagues were sent to early retirement. And Jeff was offered either a retirement package or a patent. And a patent for a really unique kind of back pressure controller. And he chose the latter and really started outfit in his garage. And um, the company Equilibar, we only use their back pressure controllers. Uh, and it's really a well-known company worldwide right now. So there are some people who do that, yeah. um, but you, you don't hear the stories very much. Yeah. And I'd like to hear more of them. Yeah. And I mean, ultimately for me, well, when I, when I finished uh, that, that stint in the Netherlands, I was luckily, I was accepted to Worcester Polytechnical Institute in Massachusetts. My parents had to pay for that because my grades weren't good enough to get a scholarship. <laughs> and so thanks mom and dad. Oh, I, uh, yeah, I think my dad might even be online, but we'll see. <laughs> um, and that's where I met a guy called Bill Moser. Bill I Moser saw him behind person. you. Was that your father behind you at one moment or somebody <laughs> no. in your apartment that you don't know? <laughs> my dad lives in Florida. And I said, that's, a, that's my, one of my oldest friends who you just saw behind me from, okay. from Warsaw. He just right. actually moved to Berlin and he was hoping to pick up his new router, which was supposed to be delivered here today. But didn't show okay. Up. I was just watching um, your knife collection over in a corner, making sure they didn't grab. <laughs> and then I'm like, Oh my God, we got it live. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, but no, professor Moser, it was a, uh, it was great. Cause I, I, we spoke about this briefly before, you know, I, I when I finished all of the, the test, uh, and I had to start working in the lab, Bill pulled me in his office and, and drew on a paper, how to make some, um, bismuth molybdate, precipitate catalysts for doing acrylonitrile synthesis and just did a simple diagram of how to build a fixed bed reactor setup. That's my coffee machine um, to, to test the catalyst. And so I'm standing there with a piece of paper and I was like, what the hell do I do with this? And he said, go ask the postdocs, they'll help you. And that was really where I fell in love with making the units for doing catalyst testing. So some people who do yeah. catalysis, they really love the materials aspect of it, um, characterizing them. Some people love to go in and atomic scale, say what's going on, you know, what site is my carbon monoxide absorbing at and with what configuration. And I'm one of these people who likes the, the tools around them. And I, as much as I have an appreciation for the material and I have a real appreciation for the know-how that goes into that. You work with a lot of people who, who do some really cool work and data mining and visualization and taking data from different sources and and it's really an exciting time we live in because you can generate so much more, but that makes it even more challenging to get something out of value out of it. Right. Um, yeah, and that's where I really learned that I like I like the tools, and uh, 
after that, uh, I, I decided to do my PhD in Europe, at, uh, in Berlin. It was Berlin post 90s. The wall had just come down. It was a very exciting place to live. Uh, it was like a time machine. I'll never forget the first time walking into East Germany. The buildings were full of bullet holes. And everything was black from the coal and right. these trabants, these, these plastic cars everywhere. It was really, really cool. Um, but in Germany, they have something called the Max Planck Society. And it's a really cool. It's a bit like our, I, don't know, I guess you call it like Fermi Lab in the States or Argonne National Labs. It's, a, it's, it's their national lab. But one of the beauty of the Max Planck Societies is you're allowed to just do research. Um, the professors are super well funded. As you know, a lot of professors struggle just funding their labs. Yeah. And so I didn't have to TA any classes. I literally walked in and from day one had the uh, unique opportunity to work in the labs. And it turned out my professor, Robert Schlugel at the time, had, he's an inorganic chemistry professor. And he had just started a catalysis laboratory. And um, He'll kill me for saying this if he ever finds out, but he didn't know anything about reactor design and nobody <laughs> in his laboratory did. They were all inorganic chemists. And I was the only chemical engineer who had come in and I was used and abused for a year and a half in a good way to basically build test setups that different people used. I'll never forget waking up after about one year and having an, an aha moment. I remember getting out of bed and looking over at my ex-wife and saying, I don't have any data for my PhD. How am I going to finish? All I've done is build tools that other people use. <laughs> Long story short, it all worked out fine. Good. Um, yeah. And then went from there to buyer, which I mean, yeah, you probably, I don't know in the States, you call it buyer or bear? Uh, both. Bear. It depends, both. depends who's saying it. Who has, yeah. Who's a little more cultured than not. <laughs> hey, when bear you got pushed a... into the deep end yeah. to build that, yeah. What was that like? Because there, you know, a lot of people struggle with that uncertainty, ambiguity, or in life where they're not being told what to do. They're like, hey, go do that. You know, you kind of got pushed into the deep end there. You had to figure that out and make it work. You mean when uh, Moser stuck me in his lab? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, that's, that was one of the examples of where you really learned um, that, you know, people skills, social skills, communication skills, um, a general ability to see the positive, even in the negative, and laugh at the irony of it at times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all, all of these things are at least as important as having some, some technical savviness. So really, you know, walking into, they had a great electronic shop. And, you know, if, if, if you can communicate your problem well to people and you treat them with respect and humility, uh, most human beings are really they're happy to help you because they feel valued. Um, and if they feel like they're appreciated by somebody, it's, it's always a really good give and take. And that was a real learning experience there, you know, because we had postdocs, there are very international, diverse accents, all stressed to get data. Um, you got to learn who was good at what. Yeah. Bundle your questions and don't bother them too much. And uh, I'm a big believer in karma. So whenever I can, I look for opportunities to help them out. Um, and that, yeah, that served me well throughout my whole life. Really just uh, one hand washes the other. In, in I, I think you're, what you're touching on is such a critical thing in life that some people never get, right? And this is that what makes the world go round. It's the opposite, which doesn't make the world go round. Um, and it's one of the reasons I, you know, I have you on this show because you have that you're humble, you know, you're doing, you're doing awesome things, cool things. You're at a level where some people never get to go to and do it, but you're humble about it. And you're, you're bringing this culture to bear that says, we're all in this together. Let's work as a team versus uh, let's leave the arrogance and all that other stuff at home and let's achieve things. So that's what's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, over time, John, my, uh, what motivated me, motivated me the most in the beginning, um, probably a good portion of stubbornness. <laughs> so that was part of it because I, uh, I really, um, I'm a bit of an idealist. I, I kind of quickly learned I'm not suited for big companies. It's, uh, we need them and we all live them and we all use their products and I value that. Um, but big company corporate culture is changing, uh, thank God. Um, because a lot of it is very outdated and I just, I couldn't wait. I needed to, too stubborn. I wanted to have my way. 
Um, and so what motivated me early on was being able to brainstorm, start things up. The, the technology was a big motivator for me in the beginning. Uh, that all of the the whole drive you have when you start something on your own, uh, sort of an undying optimism. Maybe we can talk a little bit later about everything that went into that, including if pretty much a failed marriage as a result of starting a company. Yeah. A, word, a couple of words of advice I'd love to give to people who do start on their own. But today, what motivates me the most, and it's it's really, uh, maybe it's just the old age, is, um, is the people. And really creating an environment where I love seeing these bright minds come in and to just watch them develop over time. It's super satisfying. It's uh, the, the, the psychological aspect of my job, uh, and I'm by no means a good therapist, but it's become at least as important as being a guiding mentor in the technical sense. So, you know, right. we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And I think I always refer to it as the round hole square peg problem. And I've seen it so many times in companies, you get somebody who's a peg and you try and force them into that, that, yes. that square hole and it, it doesn't work. Yeah. How many Especially times have work. you seen a brilliant scientist come in and they're, they're, yeah. they get this program or project to work yeah. on and a year later now they want to turn them into managers, which you know many times they're not good at. And you can learn yeah. it, but sometimes the way management is learned, it's not really a culture first type management. And now they start to take them away from the science and more into, and it just kind of all falls apart. Yeah. But in order to grow and, you know, climb the ladder you've got to do some of these things and i don't know it just doesn't work out well yeah yeah and i mean even at a very basic level it's amazing sometimes i'll someone who you know i knew two three years ago um i really struggled to, to give an honest opinion um because our technical people are not the social skills are not always the best yeah right. <laughs> um and the self-confidence levels are sometimes not that high as a result as soon as they're out of their comfort zone and their comfort zone is you know quantum simulations of yeah. DFT analyses or whatever, whatever. Um, and it's, it's, it's really great to see someone who maybe two or three years ago would have just struggled to contradict me um, and do that you know, today with no problem. And I have to say, it's a generational thing as well. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by how young people today will do that. So, um, you know, I had, a, I had a recent encounter with a really talented young engineer. I saw the bump late twenties and we were walking somewhere and I was annoyed by some supplier. And I said, yeah. And he was sitting there with his big gut at the table being really stubborn. And he stopped me and he said, fat shaming. That's a, that's a good way to start. I'm his boss. I'm almost twice his age. Yeah. And he called me out so well in that moment. And I've, I've encountered that a number of times. It's, it's really, you know, young people today, whether it's environmental issues, whether it's social issues, um, they're so much more in tune with these things than my generation was at that time. And that's, uh, I find that really promising. Anyhow, it kind of diverts there. <laughs> that's, good. that's a good example. <laughs> no, we're, so we're never too old to learn. Right. And, you know, you know, there is a lot of cancel culture stuff going on and things, you know, in the world, yeah. but some of it is, has a lot of validity around it. Right. And you, sometimes you step out and you look back and you say, oh, I probably shouldn't have acted that way or thought that way or whatever but yeah yeah i put i'm pretty good to put my foot in my mouth i've done it multiple times <laughs> <laughs> during the course of my career <laughs> so the, the 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 max Planck institute is yeah i was there a couple of years ago it's pretty impressive i have to tell you um and uh it, that sounded like a, a pretty awesome experience so you but you know you said uh, you got to the end and you didn't have data and you were worried but it all worked out like what what was what was that all like like at the end there because a lot of people are like fret or struggle with the end of yeah. their, their thesis yeah. and all that stuff we've gotten really yeah. good advice over the the past year about how to manage that whole process but maybe you have some words of wisdom there yeah um yeah i think it would be super helpful for a lot of people if they knew when they started something like a phd that the results that you produce um the whole technical aspect of it is really um, max 50% of why you're there. Um, one of the main reasons you're there is to learn how to deal with the unexpected, um, how to realize 
um, what you, you know, bad results are often just as valuable as good results because the whole point of a, at least my opinion, a good PhD is you're, you're testing something new, you're pushing a boundary. And every time you push a boundary, um, you're, you're finding that point at which uh, an idea is no longer applicable or which uh, something doesn't work. And so just because an experiment doesn't work out or just because the anticipated, and let's be honest, the, the thing you thought was going to happen almost never happens. <laughs> it's right. always something different. Yeah. Um, and instead of being frustrated by that, saying, oh, it, it was supposed to be like this. Um, uh, I think having a, a bit more sort of yogi-like mind, uh, mindful attitude towards it and just accepting it. Okay, all right. This is different than I expected. Why is that? You know, Did I do my experiment wrong? Is our hypothesis wrong? Um, and realize the, the 10 wrong hypotheses you have that eventually get you to the right one are all part of the process. Yeah, um, the whole ideation process. Yeah, and mind yeah, like but Yeah, but you know... Yeah, but you know, we live unfortunately in a world of impact factors and publications. And uh, that I think is sometimes hard to bring together because people are under pressure to publish, professors are under pressure to publish to bring in funding. So you've right. got this food chain going down and it's it's easy for me to say, well, be stoic, <laughs> be patient. Yeah learn from your mistakes as part of the process. On the other hand, there, I, I recognize a lot of people are pressure. And fortunately at the Max Planck Institute, it's quite unique. Um, you don't really have much of that. It's uh, yeah. because it's, it's got sort of that special, special parts of uh, how it's viewed, at least in Germany, in, in terms of science funding. And, um, you know, in the end, when it comes to writing your thesis, I think that's probably the other part where people struggle a lot. And um, mine was on 100 pages. I wanted 100 pages max. And um, it's, uh, it's really learning to sieve out everything that's not relevant and to not be too much of a perfectionist because um, it, life is full of balances of what, how much time and energy can you put into any given task and what do you get out of it. And I think a lot of people who do their PhD, they, 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 can, they can really burn a lot of energy and time with being including everything struggling to leave things out and writing the next sentence only when the first one is perfect. Put together a backbone first, yeah. have an overall structure that has a flow that tells a good, interesting story and then start filling it in. That's uh, cool. And in a sense, pub publishing helps there. So, I mean, I, I was lucky. I did three papers, not a lot, but I did three papers, but you know, the pub publishing and the peer review process helps you over the course of those, you know, four years to, to have your chapters or at least big chunks of the, the story that you tell in the end. And that was right. really helpful. And I was lucky that my PhD advisor was in the hospital in the end. I mean, it sounds very terrible to say that, but he had a back surgery, which meant he was stuck in bed because yeah. he, all he did was travel. So nailing Robert Shlugo down for any amount of time to get him to read your thesis and check it was really hard. And I was lucky he was in the hospital. He had nothing better to do than check my thesis. So it, uh, I was done in three months after writing it. So it That's hard. good. That's awesome. Yeah. So where did you, what did you do then after that? Did you take a break? You go, did you start to work right away? What was? No, no, I, I dived right into my job at Bear. And well, um, let me, let me, yeah. before I even ask you that, let me ask you this question. What did your mom and dad think when you got your PhD? Oh, I think they were, I think they were very proud. I don't think anybody yeah. in my family ever expected they'd have a, a doctor, a doctor son. Yeah. And I always get to give my dad a hard time for it because, you know, we both studied chemical engineering, but I had a PhD. He didn't. So. Yeah. But how old was your dad when he went back to school? Cause that could not. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's apples and oranges, man. And yeah. he, he paid for it all on his own. And like I said, he worked two jobs during the day and went to night school. It took him 10 years to finish his bachelor's. That's amazing. So your dad recommended for that. Totally. Yeah, I have total respect for that. So no, I was, I was spoiled. My parents paid for my education. I had no debt. You know, so many, so many people I went to college with in the States are still you know, at my age, they're still paying off their, their college debts. It's uh, quite a burden to carry with you through your life. I was, yeah. uh, I was very fortunate that my parents, they, they paid for that. 
and Max Planck in Germany. Um, that's the nice thing about doing your PhD in Germany, you get paid for it. So it's, uh, and anybody, so you can come from any country. And if you study here, you get paid. I know I try to get my daughter. Well, my daughter's in an atelier in, in Italy and I'm paying for mm -hmm. that, but I really, there was a moment there where my daughter was going to go to school in Germany because the plan was she was going to ride dressage in Germany and do school mm -hmm. and it was going to be paid ah. for. <laughs> but she, uh, she's now becoming an amazing artist in Florence. So. Ah, beautiful city. Yeah. yeah. I have one of my one of my good friends has a, her father has a gallery there. Maybe we need to talk about that offline. Oh, Galleria yeah. okay, cool. Bananti. It's one of the one of the only modern art galleries in Florence, actually. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, it's a beautiful city. But no, I already told my son if he, you know, he's 12. Like I said, if he I hope he goes to college, it's up to him. But if he chooses the states, he's paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, the decision to go to bear may be a bit of good advice there as well. You know, if you walk into a company, no matter how good the name is and no matter how much pressure your PhD advisor puts on you because he's in cahoots with the department leader at the company you're going to. If you walk into a company and your gut feeling is saying, I don't feel comfortable here. Trust your gut feeling. A gut feeling is... a it's a lot of sensory input that, that our bodies have evolved to, to have over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. I've Absolutely. really learned. Absolutely. This is the, one of the <laughs> best nuggets that has come out because I have been myself burned many times when I'm saying, uh-uh, my gut's telling me no, but I did yeah. it anyway. And you know what? Yeah. It always costs me. Yeah. You convince yourself. It's a wonderful, you can intellectualize yeah. anything to a point where you can justify, you know, whatever, but if you're, yeah, it rarely, rarely, uh, uh, gives you bad advice and, um, nothing against a company like buyer. Um, you know, people, I always say it's a bit like cheese, you know, some people like stinky cheese and some people like cheddar cheese or American cheese. <laughs> um, it's, it's a matter of taste. Some people function very well in a large corporate environment. Um, I didn't. And uh, it was a, at the time a very conservative sort of old school German way of running companies. So everybody in the suit and tie. Tie. Yeah, absolutely. Not even a common coffee room or something where people drink together. Everybody had a thermos in their own office. Um, all of these little things where I'm thinking, I, I'm a people person. And this doesn't seem like a people person place. It's changed a lot in the meantime, I have to say. Yeah. Um, if you go to BASF in Germany, which used to be renowned for being really uptight, I mean, they've got now table tennis and nobody wears a tie there anymore. So right. they've adapted over time. But yeah, definitely trust your gut feeling when you make a career choice. It's, uh, it, it, it's important. Yeah. I think I argued a long time ago that the tie would actually interfere in my work and was actually a hazard because it could get caught in something and choke me to death. <laughs> <laughs> I had 12 years of Catholic school where I had to wear a tie every day. So I've got a bit, that's why I can't wear one anymore. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it just doesn't work for me. So how long did you stay at Bear? What did you, what did you do at Bear? Um, I was very lucky because I, um, I was a little bit lost the first few months, but I met a guy called Georg Wiesmeyer, who was to this day a good friend of mine. Uh, he was he just took a job as head of R and D for Seaborg, which is a uh, you know I think the biggest petro petrochemical company in Russia. Right. Um, and Georg, uh, Georg and I totally bumped heads in the beginning. We actually really couldn't stand each other, and because he's he's really pushy German guy. And at some point, I basically told him if he doesn't change his attitude. This isn't going to work. And I was one of the few per first people to really give him pushback. And it, we've been friends ever since. <laughs> so, um, yeah, some people, some people you need, if they slap you, you need to slap back and only then it works. Um, but Georg was running a group called MAP, which stood for Miniaturization, Automation, and Parallelization. And we were some of the first groups to work with Simix, who you remember back in California, back at the time. Uh, this was, you know, 99 and it was a group that basically went to they got a pot of money from buyer it was really cool the way buyer approached it as well it was central r d and our job was to go into every production site of buyer whether it was polyurethane synthesis whether it was polyol synthesis for the polyurethane synthesis uh, looking at direct oxidation of propane to propylene oxide so everything from pretty kind of kind of what do you call it to Chemistry, which was a holy grail chemistry, where really a long shot, but if you got it, 
huge potential to really, you know, the polyurethane stuff was very, very practical. Um, and we went to all of these groups and the, our job was to basically look at how their workflows look and say, okay, how can we apply high throughput techniques to your workflows? And, you know, you looked at the time, for example, polyurethane tests, you know, they were these old Dean tests. You'd have a big, big tube and you'd squirt the isocyanide in and, and just watch how quick the tube went up and somebody was there with a little stop yep. clock or coatings testing. I remember there was the, I think it's called the MKS rub. It's a solvent and it was cheesecloth dipped into the solvent, wrapped around a hammerhead and the hammer was then lowered onto a, the surface with paint and rub back. Um, and that was an eye opener for me because that was, I, you know, I thought you're going to this high tech company, um, and there is a lot of high tech in it, but there's also a lot of low tech, which was yeah. really important to clients. And you could just see the enormous potential for eliminating, you know, operator to operator error, hammer to hammer error. Um, and if I look today at what, you know, say companies like Kempsby do in formulations or, or Labman, um, it's just, wow. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing. Amazing what's happening. Yeah. yeah. But that was at the time where people were just kind of sticking their big toe in the bathwater and saying, hmm, can we use this? What's a bit shocking, you know, we, uh, is how conservative these industries are. So if you're a Sherman Williams, for example, um, you know, you've got your standardized tests. And you could, yeah, somebody can, the, there was the technology push in the market pull and the balance was way out of whack back then, yeah. You had a huge technology push, but the market pull was not always there because it was such a conservative market. And I think it's much more in balance now. Yeah, no, that's pretty awesome. Um, so how long, how long did you stay there? I was there for actually not very long, bro. It was about two years. <laughs> so I'm not a, I'm not a super patient guy. And it was, uh, um, I was lucky. I went to a conference on micro reactor technology in Frankfurt. And there I met some former colleagues from Shell. So in one chapter I left out of this story while well, I was an intern for a year and a half at Shell Amsterdam. Um, that was just before I did my PhD. And uh, luckily, a good friend of mine realized I wasn't very happy. And he said, Anton, we're starting this company in Amsterdam called Avantium. That you'd fit into Avantium very well. And I was like, okay, friend, startup, Amsterdam. Okay, I've got to yeah. check that out. Because um, uh, I love culture. I love cities. I love music. Uh, and Amsterdam is a really, it's a wonderful place to live. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I made the move there to, to, to go to Avantium. And my job kind of was very similar uh, in the sense that it was making high throughput equipment. But as opposed to being in a, you know, a large corporate culture, you know, and Georg, my boss at, at, at Bayer, he was one of these people who excelled at a big company. And he was kind of our, um, he took the brunt of all of the big company politics and, yeah. and left us to do our work. And having someone like that is so important. That's the, um, the that role as a manager. The I call it the sponge. You let bring mm -hmm. the water in, but you only let out droplets, so people kind of shelter them. Yeah, yeah. He was uh, hugely helpful in that area, and I, I'm, to this day, I'm very grateful for him. Um, but you go from that to a company like Avantium, where Kertian, my boss at the time, you, know, you come in, and it's basically we have an empty building, which was made for offices. There's 35 million euros in the bank in investment money in one year to make this all into a high throughput laboratory. Uh, it was one of the most exciting jobs I ever had. So just a super international team, um, really talented people. Shell had sent a lot of their staff there uh, and, and people from the Shell labs were just some of the most you know, gifted researchers I had worked with. And to this day, most of them are still really good friends of mine. Uh, so it was a really collegial environment. Um, my new COO at my current company, I met there. We were both research chemists at the time. We became friends. He ultimately became a consultant and today he's our COO. So to this day, I, I still benefit from those relationships and it was great. The, uh, the reason I ultimately left Avantium was Avantium's focus is on high throughput services. And um, you know, once the infrastructure was in place, 
you know, we had a whole mix of everything from ChemSpeed ASW2000 synthesis stations and HEL parallel reactor setups and a lot of custom equipment. Um, once that, most of that was in place, the job switched and the job became executing large numbers of experiments. Right. And I'm not a chemist. I'm not a data anal analyst. Um, and it just, it was not exciting for me anymore. But I, I had a, we had a lot of clients coming and saying, hey, we've done a, we've done a project with you now. DSM doing toluene oxidation was our first big project. Um, all published, nothing confidential. Um, we like the tools. Can we have the tools? And at the time, Avantium very clearly said, we're not a tool provider. Right. It's proprietary. We, we're a service provider. So I had this growing stack of business cards of potential tool buyers, but I wasn't allowed to make them tools because that's not what my employer's focus was. Right. And ultimately, after after these two years and you know, being frustrated by the fact that we weren't doing much tool development anymore, that's the point where I said, you know what, I'm going to step out of this role. Let let the experimentalists do the experimental work and uh, give it a try and see if I can do this on my own. And when I say do it on my own, that's very misleading. You, know, you, you can't do this work on your own. And this is maybe, you know, where the experience that you were kind of getting at, how did I deal with the open-ended problem in college really helped. Um, I worked with two other companies, one called Premix based in Switzerland, which was a small family owned company that made reactors, small scale batch reactors. And one was a company in the Netherlands called Pro Control, which is a two guy outfit that made automation. And it was these two relationships that helped build ILS. So they, they were also co-investors in the company. So I put in 50,000 and they put in another 50,000. So we had a hundred grand to start with. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, having those kinds of relationships of trust across three com countries was super important. And my you know, first six years was spent in cheap easy jet airplanes, constantly flying. Every Monday morning, I'd fly at six, six in the morning to Switzerland. And every Friday night, I'd fly back in the evening. And I'd stay in cheap hotels during the whole week. Um, right. But we all believed in this idea. And that's how we grew it uh, in the beginning of the first years. And uh, yeah, it was definitely a lot of travel. But if you want to interject with questions, go ahead. I don't want to overwhelm you with that. Too much no, 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 well, no. This is really good. I think I, mean, I think people are getting the idea of what it takes to, you know, like the whole th high throughput screening or high throughput experimentation industry just didn't happen overnight. It's been mm. a it's been this buildup over the past thirty years of, you know, building you know V one equipment and then V mm -hmm. you know what I mean. It's been again yeah, an evolution, yeah. um, and it's kind of like the iPhone. Not too many people could go back and use the first version of the iPhone without throwing it across the room. And you would be yeah. that way with first versions of, you know, not all, but many HTE approaches. So yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. And then and then you had to uh, you had to believe in yourself. You but you also had to say, I'm not this person that they want me to be in this role now. I'm not going to ultimately be successful. I think I'm ready now for the next phase of my life here or career mm -hmm. life. And I've got to take this risk and go do it. Otherwise I'm going to be miserable. I think what I, what I, I still miss today and which I saw more of is um, I used to do micro reaction technology and high throughput, um, you know, really more prevalent concrete examples of products or uh, large scale processes that were developed thanks to the implementation of high throughput. Um, because it's, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the willingness of some companies to adapt it, I found, uh, frighteningly low often. <laughs> um, and the, it's, it's sometimes a bit surprising, you know, there's companies that will invest a huge amount of money in a high throughput technology, but then utterly fail in, in staffing appropriately for it. Yeah. Um, and so you're, you're touching on a really important part here. And this yeah. is where Ralph Rivero and I have noticed this in the industry over the years where um, the change management wasn't done right. Right. Mm -hmm. The, the, the culture shift that has to happen, the, yeah. the, the follow through on the investment 
And, you know, like Ralph has said, he's seen equipment come in, sit on the dock for six months, maybe a year, then get set up, then get ripped down because nobody used it. And then who knows where it went? Did it go in a, yeah. it, did it go in a landfill? Did someone buy it on eBay? You know, and it's like, what a waste of effort, money, and time when if yeah. they would have done the right uh, change management and, and ma- baked it into their strategy and their objectives, they would have had a much, much better outcome. And then that's where we honed in on that high throughput experimentation as a service, which we've been offering to try to bridge that gap. And then yeah. once it's done, say, sayonara, we got you guys. You didn't have to deal with all that failure and you don't need us anymore. Bye. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really big believer in the, uh, the small service providers. And I mean, you know, the pharma industry, I think it started uh, probably the earliest, you know, moving a lot of R&D and, and, and t- uh, toll testing to, to India in particular. Yeah. Um, but I think in the rest of the chemicals industry, there's been a, a, a big hesitance to do it, but I'm seeing increasing examples of that. So whether it's HTE here or in Heidelberg or Avantium or HD Explorer in Naples doing you know, really cool stuff around polyolefin synthesis, uh, where Nata actually from the Ziegler, Nata helped develop the, some of the first polymer polyolefins catalysts. Um, because these companies' core business is research, um, they're really efficient at bringing in tools, developing tools, but implementing them, having some, you know, MacGyver-like approaches to solving problems, but still taking safety into account. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if I look at some of my big clients, you know, they'll have a piece of kit in their lab, um, and if 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 we want to go and drill a hole in a piece of metal in that lab, um, it's at least a day process because of the safety permits that are needed. And ultimately, at the end of the day, there's a guy standing there with a gas detector, one guy from one department, the other guy with the drill, and then the project leader, and he gives him the go to make that hole. Um, I understand how safety is super important. Um, I'm not going to argue with it. But, you how, know, how, many times, how many times have you heard, I'm going to have to ask you to hold on to that handrail? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in COVID, in COVID times, I'm curious if that's lately, still is relevant. Right? Yeah. But uh, yeah. That, every time we walk down a stairway, I'm going to have to ask you to hold on to that handrail because companies have been sued for inordinate amounts of liability. Money. Yes. Yeah. 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 I completely agree. Uh, and that's yeah. That, that's so frustrating because you'll see. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes the big companies, they have the most buying power to bring the best talent in. Mm-hmm. So they hire these super bright minds and then they stick them in a lab, um, bring in a super great piece of kit. Unfortunately, um, you've got max two, maybe three years to get everything up and running. And then that person, if they're really good, they're pulled into production where they can make some money. Um, so you've got this revolving door, almost like PhDs at university. Um, and again, that's why I think, you know, small contract research companies, they don't have to be small, but they generally are smaller, um, uh, have a lot more efficiency with regards to how man hours are invested, equipment utilization. Um, and I think it's really one of the most promising areas right now in the R and D area. Yep. I think, and you see that, you see the big companies, the labs get, you know, I mentioned Shell in Amsterdam. I mean, when I used to live there, it was a whole site and now they've sold almost the entire site to the city of Amsterdam. So the old library used to go in its apartments and there's a theater yeah. there and it's really beautiful. It's very well done. And there's one building left. It's a beautiful big glass building, but it, it's one building. I know which one um, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, it, is yeah, a, yeah. it is a cool building. The new love. Yeah. So it's uh but so you're Maybe it's good. On, yeah, you're touching on this concept of the cloud lab that I've been like an evangelist for because I actually see this to the 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 investment um, that some companies may have to make, not only in equipment but in the whole process and everything, could kind of go away. You run, you pay to use the equipment, the experimentation, um, and you 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 have a data environment already set up. The standards are already there. The machine learning is on top of this. So you get this full advantage of this cloud lab, just like you have cloud computing. Um, mm-hmm. And 
I don't know. I it's kind of I it makes a ton of sense to me. And I do feel at the very least, it will be a hybrid environment, just like cloud computing in the very near future, where companies will take full advantage of these cloud labs. Yeah, no, I think it makes total sense. I and mean, we, we do a little bit of contract research at ILS, um, very limited amount, um, but it's um, it's really interesting to see how it works. I mean, basically they send us bags of samples <laughs> and we test them. Um, and the beauty is, you know, they don't have to buy the equipment and they don't have to have all of the infrastructure in place for the equipment. Um, their scientists can focus on the data analysis or doing the catalyst preparation. And we can do in that case, just, just, just the testing work for them. Um, you know, we've been doing a project now for a year and a half where we, we made a reactor, which basically simulates a fluid catalytic cracking reactor environment yeah, at a small scale. And the, this, the client just sends us little metal coupons uh, in regular intervals. We put them in this reactor and we use and abuse these coupons. Um, but it's turned out to be really critical for them in their materials choices for the reactors that they're making. Right. Um, and it's, uh, you know, they, they benefit enormously from it because they don't have the machine on site. They don't have exactly. all the infrastructure. And, you know, for us, it's, it was a fun unit to build and we operate it. And, I, you know, from our point of view, the profitability of those kinds of projects is actually, it's better. Um, because when you make units, it's very much kind of a bread and butter industry. It's uh, a, yeah. especially as a custom manufacturer like us or Zayton, for example, is probably another really great company, amazing, huge units they make. Um, half of what you turn over is what you buy and sell. Whereas if you're in the services industry, so if there's any people interested in starting, you know, companies like this, it's, it's from just purely from a business point of view, it's, it's very attractive. Yeah. You just need that initial investment. And that's, it's that, you know, it's like, it's like an activation energy barrier and that it is and an energy there's plot. Sweat, there's it, a sweat. There's a moment of sweat where you're yes. like, oh, okay, I'm going to go do all this. I went through that. And uh, well, but um, just getting the capex to put the equipment in the labs exactly. can be challenging. Yeah. But uh, I think like you say, these, these labs uh, having them remotely operated where everybody focuses on what they do well, uh, and today, you know, I'm here, I'm sitting in Berlin, you know, you're in Pennsylvania and distance is in many areas, it's not so important anymore. And I'd be very curious to see how the whole COVID and the home office phenomena that we're in now um, affects, affects that. I think people's willingness to, to look at those kinds of options, cloud labs might be more than it used to be. Yeah, I interviewed, I did a report last year, we published a report with Zippo uh, last year on the co effects of COVID and R&D and how that landscape could change. Um, uh, you know, without saying who, companies told me confidentially that they're, they're getting rid of brick and mortar. Don't, some mm. company, people will be shocked that they probably won't be coming back into their IT roles in an office. They'll have them from home, et cetera, or shared yeah. areas. But a lot of that is going to shrink because the experiment's been done. It's been proven that you can still run this company and get results without having everyone. I'm not saying you won't have important certain people mm -hmm. there, but it, so the, I think the world's going to change and I suspect it won't revert totally back the way unless the institutional knowledge gets lost after, you know, that three to five years and people forget, which happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I think you have less of that as well with these small companies because you know people can have career paths at a contract research company, yeah. which offers them an opportunity to develop over the course of 30 years within a R&D environment. Uh, at big companies, usually R&D is just it's a stepping stone on the way to something else. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. I think I think COVID is uh, is definitely probably brought some really positive changes in that way, and obviously. The other one I see is from the environmental aspect, the, the whole push for circular economy, um, hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, you know, super cool stuff like using solar thermal power to, to generate syngas. Uh, the ET of Zurich does some really cool work going in that area yeah. as well. Um, I, I, the the uh, willingness of the, 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 the market now to be open for these things has changed radically in the last year. Yeah, uh, I think we're, I, I agree. I think we're going to see a big changes in energy over the next five years. 
in 10, five to 10 years. And I think we're going to see big changes in the plastics industry as well, because, you know, oh, yeah. the more people start to see the amount of pollution on the earth in different places, the more we're going to have to come up with much better ways of dealing with plastics. So, yeah, but I don't see plastic is not the bad, the problem. It's what we, how we deal with the plastic. That I exactly. Find is the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Stop no, wrapping our food awesome. in plastic. We already lose 30% of our food. Uh, doesn't even make it to the table. Yeah, Take plastic off it. It's going to be a lot more. So. Yeah, exactly. So good. Excellent point. Um, what, did, what did I miss, Anton? What, what, what else did you want to get out there? What did, what, what well, did I just, I, I just looked, your awesome company? I just looked at the clock and I'm shocked to see an hour has passed. <laughs> Oh, my awesome company, my awesome company. I have to thank my awesome people for it. So it's really, uh, yeah, it's, we're a bit, we're kind of a small family. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them. And, uh, you know, for any, any, any listeners that are interested in doing, uh, interesting novel chemistry and need the tools to do it. Um, you know, we basically done a reactor for everything under the sun and I would claim working with us is, you don't just get a competent partner. You actually get a company that you'll have fun working with. And I, I had a colleague at Total, which is one of our good clients, conservative company as well. Yeah. And he actually mentioned that at one of the discussions with the sales guys with, uh, with the wonderful French accent. They're yeah, working with ILS. It's so very much fun to work with as well. <laughs> and I think the reason is we uh, were, we really believe in what we do. None of us are out yeah. there selling, selling vacuum cleaners. Everybody who works at our company, they're passionate idealists. It hurts a little bit every time you see a unit go because it's your baby. On the yeah. other hand, if you have a happy client in the end and, and you get some positive feedback, it's, it's just the greatest because we make things that you can't find anywhere else. And it's, uh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot let of work, me, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, let me, let me hit you cold with this question, okay? Work-life yeah. balance. You, you've been doing this for you know, a while. You, learned some, yeah. you mentioned some things earlier. We won't go into those details, but... What have you learned over the years from a work-life balance and what, what, what was your change your difference or whatever? Because I had yeah, yeah. troubles with it. So I always like yeah, to yeah. this. Probably two things that dawned on me immediately. The one is I hate the term or work-life balance. Why do I hate it? Because there's this implication that there's your work and there's your life. And when right. you work, you're not living. Man, we spend eight to 10 hours a day working. If you don't make that work for you in a positive way, then you're wasting your life. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's I said those exact same words, but then yeah. I have also get a lot of friction from my family that says, geez, dad, you're on the phone all the time. You're always on your computer. You're I agree. I agree. That's, that's the second point. Um, by the way, that's very much a first world problem. I just described. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm born in a ghetto in some poor shanty town in, in in india or south africa or south america you don't have a choice it's about survival but in our world if you can you know you can make that work what you're referring to uh, absolutely right i wasn't joking when i said my first marriage marriage failed because of my job um i was a terrible partner i was gone all the time i was stressed all of the time and in retrospect, part of the reason I worked a lot was because I, it was easier to work a lot as opposed to maybe dealing with some stuff I should have dealt with a long time ago. So yeah. I highly recommend therapy to anybody who hasn't done it. <laughs> but uh, really, you know, family and friends, uh, living a mindful life where you're not, your head isn't always just wrapped up in your job. When you're at a table, and your partner has made a meal for you, you're at the table enjoying that meal with your partner, listening to this person, enjoying them being there. That's life. And um, it's easy to lose sight of that, especially when you're young and super ambitious and all wrapped up into the company. Um, it, it's to be today still a challenge, but uh, it's one of those things that comes with old age as well. Yeah, it does, right. <laughs> you know, the saying, the youth is wasted on the young um it's uh exactly yeah i would i would recommend to anybody to, to keep that on, on on the radar but like i said i find young people today they they are much more in tune with the importance of of these things than, than my generation was when we were younger there was very much nose to the grindstone don't complain exactly do it uh, and yeah. you should be you should be happy you're lucky right yeah there's a there's a balance to be struck there all right. Well, this has been awesome. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. 
Uh, doesn't look like we have too many questions. We've already gone over a little bit. So people are probably heading to their next meetings, but have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy. Your Thanks for having tonight. me, John. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk soon. Cool. Great. Take care. Have a nice weekend. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.